How quickly will the dollar collapse? This might seem a frivolous question, while the dollar still retains its might, and is universally accepted in preference to other, less stable fiat currencies. However, it is becoming clear, at least to independent monetary observers, that in 2018 the dollar's primacy will be challenged by the yuan as the pricing medium for energy and other key industrial commodities. After all, the dollar's role as the legacy trade medium is no longer appropriate, given that China's trade is now driving the global economy, not America's. At the very least, if the dollar's future role diminishes, then there will be surplus dollars, which unless they are withdrawn from circulation entirely, will result in a lower dollar on the foreign exchanges. While it is possible for the Fed to contract the quantity of base money, indeed this is the implication of its desire to reduce its balance sheet anyway, it would also have to discourage and even reverse the expansion of bank credit, which would be judged by central bankers to be economic suicide. For that to occur, the US government itself would also have to move firmly and rapidly towards eliminating its budget deficit. But that is being deliberately increased by the Trump administration instead. Explaining the consequences of these monetary dynamics was the purpose of an essay written by Ludwig von Mises almost a century ago. I, at that time, the German hyperinflation was entering its final phase ahead of the Mark's eventual collapse in November 1923. Von Mises had already helped to stabilize the Austrian crown, whose own collapse was stabilized at about the time he wrote his essay, so he wrote with both practical knowledge and authority. The dollar, of course, is nowhere near the circumstances faced by the German mark at that time. However, the conditions that led to the mark's collapse are beginning to resonate with a familiarity that should serve as an early warning. The situation was, of course, different. Germany had lost the First World War and financed herself by printing money. In fact, she started down that route before the war, seizing upon the new charterless doctrine that money should rightfully be issued by the state, in preference to the established knowledge that money's validity was determined by markets. Without abandoning gold for her own state-issued currency, Germany would never have managed to build and finance her war machine, which she did by printing currency. The ultimate collapse of the mark was not mainly due to the Allies' reparations set at the Treaty of Versailles, as commonly thought today because the inflation had started long before. The dollar has enjoyed a considerably longer life as an unbacked state-issued currency than the mark did, but do not think the monetary factors have been much different. The Bretton Woods Agreement, designed to make the dollar appear as good as gold, was cover for the US government to fund Korea, Vietnam and other foreign ventures by monetary inflation, which it did without restraint. That deceit ended in 1971. And today the ratio of an ounce of gold to the dollar has moved to about 1, 13 10 from the post-war rate of 135, giving a loss of the dollar's purchasing power, measured in the money of the market, of 97.3%. True, this is not on the hyperinflationary scale of the mark, yet. Since the Nixon shock in 1971, the Americans have been adept at perpetuating the myth of King Dollar, insisting gold now has no monetary role at all. By cutting a deal with the Saudis in 1974, Nixon and Kissinger ensured that all energy, and in consequence all other commodities, would continue to be priced in dollars. Global demand for dollars was assured, and the banking system of correspondent Nostro accounts meant that all the world's trade was settled in New York through the mighty American banks. And having printed dollars to ensure higher energy prices would be paid, they would then be recycled as loan capital to America and her friends. The world had been bought, and anyone not prepared to accept U.S. monetary and military domination would pay the price. That was until now. The dollar's hegemony is being directly challenged by China, which is not shy about promoting her own currency as her preferred settlement medium. Later this month an oil futures contract price in yuan is expected to start trading in Shanghai. Two, only last week. The governor of China's central bank met the Saudi finance minister, presumably to agree, amongst other topics, the date when Saudi Arabia will start to accept yuan for oil sales to China. The proximity of these two developments certainly suggests they are closely related, and at the end of the Nixon-Saudi deal of 1974, which created the petrodollar, is in sight. 
Do not underestimate the importance of this development, because it marks the beginning of a new monetary era, which will be increasingly understood to be post-dollar. The commencement of the new yuan for oil futures contract may seem a small crack in the dollar's edifice, but it is almost certainly the beginning of its shattering. America's response to China's monetary maneuvering has always been that of a nation on the back foot. For the last year, the yuan has been rising against the dollar, following President Trump's inauguration. Instead of responding to China's hegemonic threat by increasing America's role in foreign trade, President Trump has threatened all and sundry with trade restrictions and punitive tariffs. It is a policy which could not be more designed to undermine America's global economic status, and with it the role of the dollar. In monetary terms, this leads us to a further important parallel with Germany nearly a century ago, and that is the contraction of the territory and population over which the mark was legal tender then, and the acceptance of the dollar today. The loss of Germany's colonies in Asia and Africa, Alsace Lorraine to France, and large parts of Prussia to Poland, reduced the population that used the mark without a compensating reduction of the quantity of marks in circulation. Until very recently, most of the world was America's monetary colony, and in that context, she is losing Asia, the Middle East and some countries in Africa as well. The territory that offers fealty to the dollar is definitely contracting, just as it did for the German mark after 1918, and as it did for the Austro-Hungarians, whose Austrian crown suffered a similar fate. The relative slowness of the dollar's decline so far should not fool us. The factors that led to the collapse of the German mark in 1923 are with us in our fiat currencies today. As von Mises put it, if the practice persists of covering government deficits with the issue of notes, then the day will come without fail, sooner or later, when the monetary systems of those nations pursuing this course will break down completely. 3. Updated for today's monetary system, this is precisely how the American government finances itself. Instead of printing notes, it is the expansion of bank credit, issued by banks licensed by the government with this purpose in mind, that ends up being subscribed for government bonds. The same methods are employed by all advanced nations, giving us a worrying global dimension to the ultimate failure of fiat currencies, whose only backing is confidence in the issuers. Now that America is being forced back from the post-war, post-Nixon shock strategy of making the dollar indispensable for global trade, the underlying monetary inflation of decades will almost certainly begin to be reflected in the foreign and commodity exchanges. There is little to stand in the way of the global fiat monetary system, led by the dollar, to begin a breakdown in its purchasing power, as prophesied by von Mises nearly a century ago. Whether other currencies follow the dollar down the rabbit hole of diminishing purchasing power will to a large extent depend on the management of the currencies concerned. How a fiat currency dies the last thing anyone owning units of a state-issued currency will admit to is that they may be valueless. Only long after it has become clear to an educated impartial monetary observer that this is the case, will they abandon the currency and get rid of it for anything while someone else will still take it in exchange for goods. In the case of the German hyperinflation, it was probably only in the last six months or so that the general public finally abandoned the mark, despite its legal status as money. Von Mises reported that throughout the monetary collapse, until only the final months, there persists a general belief that the collapse in the currency would soon end, there always being a shortage of it. The change in this attitude was marked by the moment people no longer just bought what they needed ahead of actually needing it. Instead, they began to buy anything, just to get rid of the currency. This final phase is what von Mises called the crack-up boom, though some far-sighted individuals had already acted well ahead of the crowd. Both these phases are still ahead for the American citizen. However, we can now anticipate how the first is likely to start, and that will be through dollars in foreign hands being replaced for trade purposes with the yuan, and then sold into the foreign exchanges. Once the process starts, triggered perhaps by the petrodollar's loss of its trade settlement monopoly, it is not beyond the bounds of possibility for the dollar to initially lose between a third and a half of its purchasing power against a basket of commodities, and a similar amount against the yuan, which is likely to be managed by the Chinese to retain its purchasing power. 
It will be in the interests of the Chinese authorities to promote the yuan as a sounder currency than the dollar to further encourage foreign traders to abandon the dollar. From China's point of view, a stronger yuan would also help ensure price stability in her domestic markets, at a time when countries choosing to remain on a dollar-linked monetary policy will be struggling with rising price inflation. There then emerges a secondary problem for the dollar. A fiat currency depends in large measure for its value on the credibility of the issuer. A weakening dollar, and the bear market and bonds that accompanies it, will undermine the U.S. government's finances, in turn further eroding the government's financial credibility. This will be happening after an extended period of the U.S. government being able to finance its deficits at artificially low interest rates, and is therefore unprepared for this radical change in circumstances. As the dollar's purchasing power comes under attack, lenders, whether they be those with surplus funds, or their banks acting as their agents, will increasingly take into account the declining purchasing power of the dollar in setting a loan rate. In other words, time preference will again begin to dominate forward rates, and not central bank interest rate policy. This will be reflected in a significantly steeper yield curve in the bond market, forcing borrowers into very short-term financing or using other, more stable monetary media to obtain capital for longer-term projects. This, again, plays into the yuan becoming the preferred currency, possibly with a rapidity that will be unexpected. The U.S. government is obviously ill-equipped for this drastic change in its circumstances. The correct response is to eliminate its budget deficit entirely, and refuse to bail out failing banks and businesses. Bankruptcies will be required to send surplus dollars to money heaven and therefore stabilize the dollar's purchasing power. A change in the Fed's attitude towards its banks and currency is, however, as unlikely as that of the Reichsbank subsequent to the Versailles Treaty. Therefore, it follows that capital markets and dollars will inevitably be severely disrupted, and market participants will seek alternatives. Remember that the dollar's strength has been based on its function in trade settlement and its subsequent deployment as the international monetary capital of choice. Both these functions can be expected to go into reverse as the trade settlement function is undermined. Whether China will be tempted to employ the same methods in future to support the yuan as the Americans have during the last 43 years for the dollar, remains to be seen. It may not be a trick that can be repeated. There is a great danger that a significant fall in the dollar will lead to global economic stagnation, coupled with escalating price inflation, affecting many of China's trading partners. China will want to insulate herself from these dangers without adding to them by going for full-blown hegemony. We are beginning, perhaps, to see this reflected in rising prices for gold and silver. China has effectively cornered the market for physical gold, the only sound money of the market that over millennia has survived all attempts by governments to replace it. Her central planners appear to have long been aware of the West's Achilles heel in its monetary affairs, and have merely been playing along to China's own advantage. As the dollar weakens in the coming years, her wisdom in securing for herself and her citizens the one form of money that's no one else's liability will ensure her survival in increasingly turbulent times. The Principle of Monetary Policy A Chinese teal once upon a time the treasury of the Celestial Empire was found empty the emperor instructed Hua, the chairman of the Heavenly Research Council, to work out a plan to meet the emergency. Hua suggested that the emperor assume the title, the Son of Heaven, thereby laying claim to supernatural powers. The emperor would then inject words and phrases such as, targeting the money supply, clean versus dirty floating, the crawling peg, semi-fixed standard, snake in the tunnel, softening the bands of hard currencies, and so forth, into the public debate on money, thereby endowing these meaningless words with sacramental effects. The purpose of this exercise would be to induce men to give up actual goods and services in exchange for fictitious ones. The emperor went along with these proposals and debased the silver coins of the empire, while retaining the coin's outward appearance. But the people refused to be duped, and they accepted the debased coins only at a discount. Hua threw himself at the feet of the emperor. Son of heaven, it is not enough for you to claim absolute power over the value of coins and over the destiny of the people. You must also forbid any examination of your claims. You must outlaw logic. All questions about currency depreciation must be tabooed. 
to ask them, to answer them, even to think of them must be declared an act of sacrilege, an unpardonable sin. Only then will people believe that coin clipping is no self-mutilation, but rather the mutilation of their competitors. Only then will the coolie stop cursing and start blessing his yoke. The emperor was not impressed. Huh, <laughs> you talk like a fool. Even a child can see through your theocratic fraud. All he need ask is whether the priest is the instrument of religion, or religion is the instrument of the priest. The proof that the people have been duped is that the priest is rich and powerful. He can taboo questions, he can adjust moral principles to suit himself. So your studied gestures and poses, your hieroglyphic messages are losing their effects, because people observe your simony, the trafficking of relics. Seek as one may, there is no substitute for an informed and enlightened public opinion. It is the only remedy. Then the emperor recalled the debased coinage, and let it be known that hard times can be overcome if everybody worked, and saved, even harder. Before twelve moons had passed, the treasury was once more replete with full-bodied silver coins. The biggest human exploitation today people take it for granted that targeting the money supply is a legitimate objective of monetary policy it wasn't always like that. In 1932, the Canadian economist and humorist, Stephen Leacock, could joke, the gold standard has fallen into opprobrium. A while ago it looked as safe as the rock of ages, and now it is being relegated to the age of rocks. We have been learning some new economic truths. Consider the control of the money supply. What does it mean? A lot of flowery words have grown up around this. But if that means anything at all, it means that there will be a board, a committee of people who will, when they like, expand money or contract money and boost prices up or boost prices down. There will be three men in a room somewhere who will do that. If that time ever comes, I want to be one of the three, or at least a warm personal friend of all three. Now I say this in all sincerity that the three men in a room stuff will do for the Soviets. It will not do for us. You cannot have a system of social controls dependent upon the will of three men in a room. You cannot have prices which can be moved up by a group in control. You cannot have wages which can be shifted down in their purchasing power by the goodwill of the men of the monetary caste. You must weigh that very very carefully. The board, when it boosts prices up or down, would follow or be tempted to follow, all sorts of self-seeking ends. You cannot run society like that. If you try to have a money standard based on human interest or opinion, you have started the biggest human exploitations one can possibly imagine. The greatest virtue of the gold standard the concept of the money supply is a spurious one, and the idea of targeting the money supply by open market operations of the Fed is a modern theocratic fraud, establishing the biggest scheme of human exploitation in history. The extent to which this method of plunder is practiced is an inverse proportion to the perspicacity of the people. It is in the nature of abuses to go as far as they can. Plunderers conform to the Malthusian law. They multiply in direct proportion with the means of existence, and the means of existence for knaves is the credulity of their dupes. If God had made man a solitary animal, everyone would labor for himself, and individual wealth would be in proportion to the services that each man performed for himself. But since man is a social creature, services are exchanged for services. Moreover, to provide for certain needs such as security the members of society organize governments and agree to tax themselves in order to cover these needs. The government too is subject to the Malthusian law. It tends to expand in proportion to its means of existence which, in the last analysis, is nothing but the substance of the people. So when the government runs out of real services, it will continue to expand by offering fictitious services to the taxpayer. Targeting the money supply is one of the most reprehensible of these fictitious services. In private transactions each party remains the sole judge of both values, the value of services rendered, and that of services received. The individual is perfectly free either to decline the exchange or to make it elsewhere. The greatest virtue of the gold standard is that the medium through which these services are exchanged is left outside of the political arena, and hence individual valuations remain as free of distortion as possible.
But when government starts targeting the money supply it interposes between the exchanging parties a medium which cannot be valued because it has, by design, no definable value. In combination with that fatal disposition, that one man could always be persuaded to live at the expense of others, this interposition by the government creates enormous disparities between the exchanging parties, while plundering both. The people are astonished to find that, while they hear of wonderful inventions that are supposed to save labor and multiply output without end, they are working as hard as ever and are still no better off than before. Meanwhile, things go from bad to worse and, at last, people open their eyes, not the remedy for they have not yet progressed that far, but to the evil. Monetary policy under limited government targeting the money supply is an arbitrary and unlimited power, which is at variance with our constitution and with the principles on which our government is based. Constitutionally, the government has a carefully circumscribed responsibility in the realm of money. This is to see to it that the value of every kind of money in circulation, namely coins, bank notes, bank drafts, bank deposits, etc., rigidly conforms to the standard unit of value, the government is charged with the responsibility of stabilizing the value of currency and is must not aggrandize its powers by destabilizing it. Legal tender then, and the acceptance of the dollar today. The loss of Germany's colonies in Asia and Africa, Alsace-Lorraine to France, and large parts of Prussia to Poland, reduced the population that used the mark without a compensating reduction of the quantity of marks in circulation. Until very recently, most of the world was America's monetary colony, and in that context, she is losing Asia, the Middle East and some countries in Africa as well. The territory that offers fealty to the dollar is definitely contracting, just as it did for the German mark after 1918, and as it did for the Austro-Hungarians, whose Austrian crown suffered a similar fate. The relative slowness of the dollar's decline so far should not fool us. The factors that led to the collapse of the German mark in 1923 are with us in our fiat currencies today. As von Mises put it, if the practice persists of covering government deficits with the issue of notes, then the day will come without fail, sooner or later, when the monetary systems of those nations pursuing this course will break down completely. 3. Updated for today's monetary system. This is precisely how the American government finances itself. Instead of printing notes, it is the expansion of bank credit, issued by banks licensed by the government with this purpose in mind, that ends up being subscribed for government bonds. The same methods are employed by all advanced nations, giving us a worrying pse in November 1923. Von Mises had already helped to stabilize the Austrian crown, whose own collapse was stabilized that about at the time he wrote his essay, so he wrote with both practical knowledge and authority. The dollar, of course, is nowhere near the circumstances faced by the German mark at that time. However, the conditions that led to the mark's collapse are beginning to resonate with a familiarity that should serve as an early warning. The situation was, of course, different. Germany had lost the First World War and financed herself by printing money. In fact, she started down that route before the war, seizing upon the new charterless doctrine that money should rightfully be issued by the state, in preference to the established knowledge that money's validity was determined by markets. Without abandoning gold for her own state-issued currency, Germany would never have managed to build and finance her war machine, which she did by printing currency. The ultimate collapse of the mark was not mainly due to the Allies' reparations set at the Treaty of Versailles, as commonly thought today because the inflation had started long before. The dollar has enjoyed a considerably longer life as an unbacked state-issued currency than the mark did, but do not think the monetary factors have been much different. The Bretton Woods Agreement, designed to make the dollar appear as good as gold, was cover for the US government to fund Korea, Vietnam and other foreign ventures by monetary inflation, which it did without restraint. That deceit ended in 1971. And today the ratio of an ounce of gold to the dollar has moved to about 1, 13 tenth from the post-war rate of 135, giving a loss of the dollar's purchasing power, measured in the money of the market, of 97.3%. True, this is not on the hyperinflationary scale of the mark, yet. Since the Nixon shock in 1971, 
the Americans have been adept at perpetuating the myth of King Dollar, insisting gold now has no monetary role at all. By cutting a deal with the Saudis in 1974, Nixon and Kissinger ensured that all energy, and in consequence all other commodities, would continue to be priced in dollars. Global demand for dollars was assured, and the banking system of correspondent Nostro accounts meant that all the world's trade was settled in New York through the mighty American banks. And having printed dollars to ensure higher energy prices would be paid, they would then be recycled as loan capital to America and her friends. The world had been bought, and anyone not prepared to accept U.S. monetary and military domination would pay the price. That was until now. The dollar's hegemony is being directly challenged by China, which is not shy about promoting her own currency as her preferred settlement medium. Later this month an oil futures contract priced in yuan is expected to start trading in Shanghai. How quickly will the dollar collapse? This might seem a frivolous question, while the dollar still retains its might, and is universally accepted in preference to other, less stable fiat currencies. However, it is becoming clear, at least to independent monetary observers, that in 2018 the dollar's primacy will be challenged by the yuan as the pricing medium for energy and other key industrial commodities. After all, the dollar's role as the legacy trade medium is no longer appropriate, given that China's trade is now driving the global economy, not America's. At the very least, if the dollar's future role diminishes, then there will be surplus dollars, which unless they are withdrawn from circulation entirely, will result in a lower dollar on the foreign exchanges. While it is possible for the Fed to contract the quantity of base money, indeed this is the implication of its desire to reduce its balance sheet anyway, it would also have to discourage and even reverse the expansion of bank credit, which would be judged by central bankers to be economic suicide. For that to occur, the US government itself would also have to move firmly and rapidly towards eliminating its budget deficit. But that is being deliberately increased by the Trump administration instead. Explaining the consequences of these monetary dynamics was the purpose of an essay written by Ludwig von Mises almost a century ago. I, at that time, the German hyperinflation was entering its final phase ahead of the mark's eventual collapse too. Only last week, the governor of China's central bank met the Saudi finance minister, presumably to agree, amongst other topics, the date when Saudi Arabia will start to accept yuan for oil sales to China. The proximity of these two developments certainly suggests they are closely related, and that the end of the Nixon slash Saudi deal of 1974, which created the petrodollar, is in sight. Do not underestimate the importance of this development, because it marks the beginning of a new monetary era, which will be increasingly understood to be post-dollar. The commencement of the new yuan for oil futures contract may seem a small crack in the dollar's edifice, but it is almost certainly the beginning of its shattering. America's response to China's monetary maneuvering has always been that of a nation on the back foot. For the last year, the yuan has been rising against the dollar, following President Trump's inauguration. Instead of responding to China's hegemonic threat by increasing America's role in foreign trade, President Trump has threatened all and sundry with trade restrictions and punitive tariffs. It is a policy which could not be more designed to undermine America's global economic status, and with it the role of the dollar. In monetary terms, this leads us to a further important parallel with Germany nearly a century ago, and that is the contraction of the territory and population over which the mark was 